In this video, we're going to look at ways to turn 2D curvature into 3D topography in Rhino. You can do this using imported curvature geometry, or you can draw it right in Rhino. If you want to do it that way, I'll show you a technique to do it. You can do this by tracing directly over an image or a topo map, or whatever, using the picture command in Rhino. To use the picture command, I'm just going to write picture in the command dialog box. Then I can select my picture open it, and I'm going to draw it on the top plane. I could use a topo map, but in this instance I'm going to use a picture of Saul Steinberg's fingerprint. Now you can't really make topo curves directly from a fingerprint because the circles aren't concentric, but what I can do is trace them and make a fingerprint inspired topography. So I'm going to maximize my top viewport. The way that I'm going to do this is I'm going to make a control point curve, and I'm just going to start clicking and making some closed curves. Then I'll hit enter and I'm going to repeat that command. And I can just keep tracing these. Until I've got enough curves to make a topography. Now if this were a traditional topo map, I would just trace the lines on that map. This process is easy, but it's a little bit tedious, so I'm not going to go through the whole thing here in this tutorial. To save time, I'm just going to import a set of curves that I made in Illustrator and use those. The way to do that is simply to go to File, Import, and from there I can import this AI file directly. I can also import a uh, DXF or a DWG or a whole bunch of other vector files. This one I have is an AI, so I'm just going to use that going to give me this option here. Because I don't really care what the size of these are just yet, I'm just going to go ahead and import them, move them to where I can see them, and that looks good enough for now. All right, cool. The next thing that I need to do is make sure that I'm working at the right scale. Now, this part here is going to be a little bit wacky because this is a completely imaginary landscape. But what I do know is that I need to stretch it over a site that's 62 feet by 62 feet because I want to make a model that's 15 and a half inches by 15 and a half inches at a quarter scale. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to be working at real life scale. So what I would like to do is make a square just to check my work. And I'm going to say it's going to be a 62 foot by 62 foot square. And I can see that I am way off here. So what I need to do is just grab my topo lines. And I'm just going to make them bigger. So I'm going to shift, drag from there, and just make it way, 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 way bigger. <laughs> and I'm just going to move them to make sure that I've got good site coverage there. Maybe make it a little bit bigger, maybe adjust it so this other peak is on the site. And that's good enough for me because this is a completely made up landscape. Okay, so if I switch to a perspective view, I can see that this is still totally flat. So what I need to do now is start arranging these curves so I can make them into a three dimensional landscape. And the way that I'm gonna do that is by simply lifting these curves up a group at a time. Now, if this were based on a real topo map, the topo map would tell me what the contraval in tour was. Often this is two, four, or eight feet. What I'm gonna do is because again, this is completely made up, I'm just going to make these one foot increments. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to raise each group of these curves up by foot. And then I'm going to control, unselect this, move them up by a foot. Control, unselect, move them up by a foot. And you can see here what I'm doing in 3D is I'm building a mountain out of these. Now if I wanted to build a valley, I would go the other way, or if I wanted to build some kind of undulating landscape, then I would maybe alternate between moving them up and moving them down. But I'm going to build a mountain here, so I'm just going to keep moving these up one foot at a time, unselecting the outermost one, and occasionally checking my work to make sure that I didn't miss one. But see how these are evenly spaced? That's what I want. Okay, so I fast forwarded here, and now you can see I've got all of my curves distributed evenly on the z-axis. So now what I need to do is I need to make these into some sort of solid thing. So the easiest way to go about doing this is to loft them. Actually, no, that's not true. The best way to do this is going to be to patch it because if I loft it, I'm going to end up with something with a flat top. But 
what I want to do is I'm going to go over the lofting method first just because it gives a really clear demonstration of the importance of having properly built curves and using the rebuild command before trying to generate a topography and then we'll cover the patch command. So there's a command in Rhino that you probably know by now called loft. Now if I just type that in loft I'm going to get something that looks completely insane. And the reason is because these stacks, they need to be lofted separately. And there's a couple other reasons for this, and we're gonna go through them real quick. So the way to prevent this from happening, if I undo this, is to simply select one group of concentric shapes at a time. So basically, if you've got a mountain, select the mountain. If you've got a valley, select the valley. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna grab these guys here, and I'm going to loft them. And this still doesn't look very good, and I'll tell you why. So if I undo this, and I select these, actually, let's just select one curve at a time. Now see how unevenly distributed these points are along this curve? This is gonna cause Rhino a lot of confusion. Same here, there's a lot of densely distributed but unevenly distributed points here too. So what's gonna help Rhino out a lot is if I just simply rebuild these curves. So if I select these and I write the command rebuild, then it's going to give me the option to remap these curves basically and redistribute these, um, these points that control it, right? So you can see here on these, these black ones, these are the rebuilt previews. So if I have a really low count of like four, you're not even going to resemble the original curve. But if I up the count and re-preview them, then they start to take shape a little bit more. Now six is not going to be enough at all. Let's go with like, I don't know. 50. There we go. That's a lot more like the real curves. And now you can see when I click on them, these points are nicely evenly distributed. And the other thing that happens here is that the top number of curve, or the top curve is going to have the same number of points as all of the other curves, and they're all going to be evenly distributed. So that's going to cause Rhino to be way less confused. So this way, when I select them and I loft them, I say OK. I'll do a close loft. All right, well, maybe I won't close it. Maybe I'll just loft it. There we go. That's a way nicer looking geometry. Now, if I want to tweak this, obviously, I can move these contours around. I can do the same steps over here. Let's go here. Rebuild. Let's just do the same points. Point out before, loft here. And now I've got two nice looking, pretty neat topographies here. Now, if I want the tops to be flat, which I probably don't, I could simply cap them, or I can try something else here. What I can do here instead of this, if I want the top to have a geometry that flows more naturally, is instead of lofting these curves together, what I can do is I can patch them. And I'll show you what that looks like. Okay, so I'm gonna start by deleting these poly surfaces. Get rid of this guy this guy. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab these curves. I don't need this original square. And if I just write patch, then it's going to do its best. And it's not really going to give me a, um, a I mean, we'll give me a preview. Yeah, there you go. It's going to do its best to fit a curve to all the, or to fit a surface to all this stuff. And you can see now I've got a nice little peak there. And the thing that's made this really work really well is the fact that I did rebuild those curves. So now I've got a surface that fits those curves really nicely. I'll do the same thing over here. Unselect this guy. And there you go. Now you might have noticed that because I patched these sets of contours separately, I don't really have any quote unquote ground at the base of these mountains. The nice thing about the patch command is that unlike the loft command, I don't have to patch these sets separately. And if I patch them together, I'm going to get a much more natural ground condition at the base of these mountains. The problem is it's going to give me a whole bunch of extra geometry that I'm going to have to deal with. But that's actually a really easy problem to manage, and I'll explain how to deal with it at the end of the video. First though, let's take a look at how to fine tune these surfaces. Now if that still doesn't give you what you want, you can also try adjusting the patch settings. So if I delete this, Go back, reselect these curves, and write patch. You can see here I've got this sample point spacing. 
the number of U spans, the number of V spans, and the stiffness. If I adjust the stiffness, that's going to um, change how how stiffly this, how basically how closely to these uh, source shapes the surface conforms. So, for example, if I up this to like uh, 500, you can see it's it's just going to be pretty, it's going to be really bad. But if I change it to something like uh, 100, right? Then it gets less stiff. And so the less stiff you make it, the more closely it will conform to the original surface. So if I change it to like, you know, well, let's take it down to the original value of one. It's going to conform really well. OK, cool. So the other thing that it lets me adjust is the number of UV spans. And that's not immediately clear what that means. But if I do this and I click on it, you see how many lines? It's got this grid on here this, uh, that kind of goes in like the x and the y direction. Those are the number of UV spans, and the more of those I have, the softer the surface will be, essentially. The more closely it will conform to the original uh, data points. So, for example, if I delete this, and I go back to my patch command, and I decrease this to, like, 4 and 4, and I preview it, you can see I've got... Uh, a service that doesn't conform that well to the original geog or to the original curves, but it's really, really smooth. And if I click on it, you'll see I have a way fewer UV spans, which means that also if I want to adjust this surface, it'll be a lot less adjustable. But the uh, but what adjustments I do make will be really smooth and will be really easy. Now, I don't really want that because it doesn't fit in my curves very well. So I'm going to go back and I'm going to patch it again. I'm going to take this back up to 20. 20. And if I look over here, I can see that there's not a lot of gaps between the curves and the surface. And that's, that means I'm fitting those curves really well. If I want to adjust this even more, I can zoom in and I can click on the surface and I can say, points on. And you'll notice that what this does is this draws a point basically on all the intersections of those UV curves, right? And what this does is these are basically control points that control the geometry of the surface. And so if I click on them and I adjust these points, I can tweak the way that the surface is shaped and I can really fine tune it. Now if I want my surface to be more adjustable, this is where the UV mapping that I talked about a minute ago comes in. I could basically, I can rebuild this surface. And let's say I go back down to my really coarse surface with the with the four UV point or the four UV um, grids, then you see I get way fewer points. And if I adjust them, the adjustments are really coarse. So I don't really want to do that. But if I want it to be way adjustable, I can bump this up to like 50, 50. And you can see now I have way, way more grids, and I can really tweak these, right? Now, this is not really what I want, but I'm just trying to give you an example of how these operations work. I think that 20 and 20 for a scale like this is probably fine. Again, if you need more adjustability, then rebuild as necessary. So with those examples illustrated, what I'm going to do is I'm going to hit undo a couple of times. I'm going to get back to the surface that I really liked, and I'm going to show you how to do one more thing that's a little bit tricky, um, but I think it's really helpful. So it, when you have a surface like this, it's really hard to get a natural looking flat spot in it. But what I'm going to show you to do is to use the set points command to achieve that. So that command is simply set points. And this is going to ask you what point direction you want to set. So if I look down I have here at my little um, coordinate plane, I can see that I don't really want to move the points in the y direction. I don't want to move the points in the x direction. I just want to adjust some of the points in the z direction because I want to make a flat spot in that direction. So let me explain what that means. So let's say I want to take, I want to make a flat spot right around here. What I can do is I can select these points. And I can't see this one, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to change my view to ghosted instead. Do, 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 shaded, ghosted. And now I can see this point. Grab it, grab it, grab it, grab it. And let's say I want this flat spot to be about, I don't know, right there. Then I know because I spaced these contours at one foot apart 
um, vertically that one, two, three, four, this Z location is four feet up. So if I say set point with those commands, with those selected, and I unselect X, unselect Y, and just leave Z selected, I say apply, it's going to ask me where it wants, where I, it wants me to set them, and I'm just going to say four feet, and it'll move all those points to the four feet in that, on that axis. So you can see now what I've done is I've created a really natural looking flat spot right there. And that's normally pretty hard to do, um, but using the set point command makes it fairly easy. Anyway, one more quick tip. So now that we've covered all that stuff in fairly thorough detail, let's look at a couple of things that are gonna make working with partial topo curves, smaller sites, and models way easier. In the previous example, we patched both of these mountains separately, like so. Patch, patch. This left us without any quote unquote ground. To prevent that, let's just patch them together. Now you can see this leaves us with a bunch of extra surface that we have to trim, but we'll cover that how to deal with that in a second. In the meantime, this does leave us with a very natural looking ground condition. We can rebuild this surface using the same techniques that we already covered. The other thing about the previous examples is that they all used closed topo curves, but if you're working with only partial topo curves, this technique will still work, but it'll leave you with a bunch of extra surface just like this technique that you have to deal with in the same way. So let's take a look at dealing with both of these types of situations. In order to make this example, I'm gonna to have to make some partial curves. And in order to make those partial curves, I'm gonna end up making the same tool that I'm gonna to use to solve this problem. So remember this square that I made down here as a reference geometry to indicate the boundaries of my site or my model? What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this and I'm going to extrude it and I'm gonna make it into a sort of cookie cutter. I can do this using the command extrude curve or I can just click on it and I can grab this little circle on the gumball and I can just do it that way. Then I'm gonna click it I'm going to move it down just a little bit so I know that it intersects with all of this surface. I can click the surface and I can say split, click this as my cutting object, hit enter, and now I can just delete this stuff after I've split it. There we go. Now I've got a site that's the right size. You'll notice that it's too low on the bottom. No problem. What I can do is I can simply click this, turn it into a planar surface, And then what I'll probably do is I will probably scale it a little bit. Oh, that's the curve, not the surface. There we go. And what that does is that it ensures that all of the boundaries of this surface are beyond the boundaries of this surface. And then I can click this. I can say split again, split it with this. And you can see there what it's done is it's kind of cut off these little bits that were just too low. Okay, then if I want to turn this into a sort of 3D chunk of earth, I can click on this and I can say extrude surface. I can bring it straight down. Maybe I'll bring my planar surface back. Maybe I'll do a Boolean split. With this, that's going to fail. That's okay. I'll just try a regular split. Delete this. And then maybe I'll split this with this. I can delete this. And now I've got a closed here. It'll be more obvious if I change to a shaded view. Now I've got a closed poly surface of my site. Now let's backtrack one more time so we can see how to deal with some open topo curves. So let's hit Control Z a few times. And we're back. So let's do this again. Let's extrude this curve, make a cookie cutter, bring it down, and let's use this curve or this uh, cookie cutter to split all these curves. Here, the easiest way to do this is just gonna be select everything and then to unselect that. 
Then I'll say split this stuff with this thing, enter. And now what I can do is I can go and I can select all these curves outside of it. Get rid of this, get rid of this, get rid of this guy and that guy too, and you, and you. Oh, and also you. Okay, cool. So if you've got something like a partial topography where you don't have these closed loops, the loft command won't work, but it didn't work very well in the first place, but the patch command, it'll still work just fine. So if I go back to a perspective view, get rid of this guy, maybe I want to just hide this, take all these guys, say, Patch, sure, there we go. I have another surface. Now, just like before, I've got way too much surface that I have to trim, but as before, I can simply show that reference geometry, make a cutter, split with this, enter, delete, and there we go.